247 Noodle Juice and you might want to go easy on that juice. Well, ha. No, I'm f- I'm fine. Okay, I'm f- perfectly fine. I'm just just a little tipsy. Okay? But I can manage. I can manage just fine. I'm a professional, you know. I'm first I can do, because I know what I've, I have all... Oh, uh, hey, hey, buddy, you want to watch out where you're walking there. There's a hole. In- what? Floor. Yeah, see? We're just trying to be of service there. But some folks are, are determined to learn the hard way. Greetings, friends, and welcome in to this, the 247th edition of Fusebox, quenchingly entitled Noodle Juice, and this is a real thing. I kid you not, and uh, we'll get into all that shortly. I'm your overflowing with underwhelming presence, host Mark Rose, and over there, sitting in the mist in shrouded glow of pulsing rectifiers and insolent LEDs is the Prince Regent of the Resonant Filter Milt Keynes, everybody. Well, thank you kindly. As usual, I have no fucking clue as to what this title means or... <laughs> well, I just like to keep you guessing, Mr. Keynes. It's as simple as that. <laughs> well, 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 then flip all the cards then, because uh, what the hell is noodle juice, bro? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. I'm sure your brain is just ricocheting off the inside of your oak veneer paneled head, (laughs) wondering what or maybe how one could uh, extract a liquid from a noodle. A fair question, Mr. Keynes. I I will tell you this. It, uh, It all stems from a search I was doing the other day on a completely unrelated topic and quite literally stumbled on this little nugget of ephemera that, uh, struck me as uh, something that might be of interest to our listener. Oh, well, uh, that clears it up. (laughs) Less history, more mystery, Mr. Cage, you know. (laughs) Uh, The answer to this is forthcoming. Uh, As are a couple of other curious events oozing up from, yes, down there, in that area, down there. And uh, also the news of a closing and eventual demolishing of a historic site in Nevada. Oh, hell. They're not closing Mustang Ranch. Uh, uh, no, no, no. That uh, that establishment is doing just fine, Mr. Keynes. Hell, it's a, a major attraction these days. Uh-oh. Fun for the whole family. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I've been told. Uh, they they actually even have a uh, Facebook page for carp sake. Hey, I think that place would be perfect for like a, a fuse box interview, an investigative report kind of thing. Um, Maybe we do a remote from there, even, huh? You know, I mean, it's only Nevada; it's a short flight. I bet you. We can- uh, look, look <laughs> uh, you know what? I totally understand your uh, interest in this, but no, I mean, I, we can do a real deep investigation you know find out what's really going on out there yeah i i don't want to be a buzz killer here but i think we're all very well aware of what goes on out there <laughs> it's a brothel and uh, quite legal by the way so they say no 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 really it is it's all very legal and has been in operation over there since uh 1971 now they did have a little issue or two in 1999 when the uh, place went into tax forfeiture. And uh, the original owner then fled to Brazil, where (laughs) Brazil later refused to extradite that guy for his tax issues here in the USA. Uh, But later, apparently, it was uh, reopened in a uh, new location as some of the property 
sadly, was uh, burned in a fire department exercise, uh, and that's for real, but it uh, reopened in 2007 with a brand new owner. You seem to know a lot about this thing, bro. Well, I, I'm just... Like maybe you have inside knowledge. Oh, no, no, no. I've never so, had... Mr. Rose... Just how many times have you frequented this establishment? I have never... Does the name Kitty ring a bell? No. I've... Kitty? How about Trixie? I... Maybe the name Madam Pinchy will strike a chord. Now cut that out! <laughs> <laughs> All this and uh, so much less when we return, friends. So uh, stay with us. Or aren't we? I don't understand. A bloodthirsty homicidal killer. And he makes house calls. Dr. Butcher, MD. <laughs> you like that one, guys? <laughs> Oh, that's a classic. Zombie Holocaust. Or uh, retitled as Dr. Butcher, M.D., Medical Deviant. Mm, I think it's oh, how did I learn about all this? Well, you know, back in the day, through magazines. Famous Monsters, Castle of Frankenstein, things like that. <laughs> yeah, like the ones I have upstairs. But you know what? There's a new place to go for info about stuff like this and everything else in the Grindhouse world. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is, Milo. It's called Grindhouse Resurrection Magazine. And it's jam-packed with articles about these films. You know, the folks who write for GRM, they lived it. And there's a piece in the premiere issue all about early zombie movies without a bite. You should check it out. There's a link in the show description to get your paws on a copy. Greenhouse Resurrection! Yay! <laughs> Better than a subpoena. TheFuseBoxShow.com all righty, friends. Uh, the title of our episode on this one is Noodle Juice, and I know what you're probably thinking. What the hell are you smoking? And please, pass it over here. The title comes from, as I mentioned at the top of the show, a search I was doing for a uh, completely unrelated topic. The history of eggs? <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, to be honest, I don't recall what it was I was searching for. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah just keep that VPN running, bro. <laughs> In any event, I found myself following a link to uh, slang terms of the 1920s. And uh, as many know, I'm a big fan of that stuff, especially old carny terms. Yeah, we had a bunch of them in the past as uh, show titles. Uh, cheese wheel sucker. Corn punk caper, uh, the deuce spot. Very good, Mr. Keynes. Well, I have my moment. Well, this page contained a term I've never encountered before, noodle juice. And uh, it relates to something that led me on another tangent that leads to this very segment. Dog works in mysterious ways. His miracles to perform. <laughs> the term noodle juice refers to tea. Tea? Yes, sir. Tea. Noodle juice is tea. Uh, well, you know, I, I think there's another definition of this Yes, thing, yes, yes, I'm... yes, but we're not going there, Mr. Keynes. This is the 1920s, and they were d just having fun. It's uh, really unclear as to the actual origin of this term, but it was widely used. <laughs> Got me to thinking about tea in general and just how this substance became such a thing. And it uh, turns out that uh, it's got some very, very twisted origins. Twisted, you say? Well, yeah. Well, one of the more pedestrian anecdotes um, surrounds the uh, adding of milk to tea. Yeah, the folks in the UK are fond of that, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Well, many are. But what's interesting was that it had absolutely nothing to do with enhancing the flavor. According to Fortnum and Mason, low-quality china cups would crack when hot tea was poured into them, so putting the milk in first meant your cups would stay intact. Quoting here, when finer and stronger materials came into use, 
this was no longer necessary, so putting the milk in last became a way of showing that one had the finest china on one's table. Evelyn Waugh once recorded a friend using the phrase, rather milk in first, to refer to a lower class person. And the habit became a social divider that had absolutely nothing to do with the taste of tea. Pinkies up. And the stuff was highly prized at the time, too. Folks would keep the uh, teas in uh, locked boxes. The uh, V&A Museum has an example of such a box, uh, uh, and according to them, these were usually known as tea chests. Although they are now generally referred to as tea caddies, such boxes often contained two or more compartments for different types of tea or for sugar, stored in small metal containers known as tea canisters. As a matter of fact, so prized were uh, many of these teas that uh, in the book, The World in Your Teacup, Celebrating Tea Traditions Near and Far, I wonder if they could have made that title longer. Uh, author Lisa Bolt Richardson writes... At one time in the late 18th century, many believed that more tea was imported through illegal methods than through legal channels. To make matters worse, smugglers began compromising the purity of the tea by mixing it with leaves from other plants, thus stretching their supply and increasing their profits. Uh, These additives included twigs, sawdust, and sheep dung. Reportedly, in 1770, one village near London was quoted as producing more than 20 tons of adulterated material a year for supply to tea merchants. Their recipe was ash leaves boiled with, say it with me, sheep dung. Uh, Only for color, though. That's a lot of sheep dip. True. Well, friend, you, you might well be asking... Oh, sure, that was then, and people were just desperate and a little crazy from drinking paint varnish. But what about now, Mr. Know-it-all? I'm glad you asked. As it turns out, I found two rather uh, unique tea blends for you. Uh, Try at your own peril, friends. Fusebox does not endorse or otherwise recommend the use of the following tea blends. The use or misuse of aforementioned tea blends may cause severe side effects, such as spontaneous combustion, sudden stupidity, and voting Republican. So, uh, for the first uh, unique blend, how about fermented yak butter tea? Yeah, no. Yes, fermented yak butter tea is described as a creamy beverage that has been around for centuries. It's one of the most popular teas in Tibet, a region known for its (laughs) freezing temperatures. Yeah, they're so frozen up there, they can't taste anything. Well, (laughs) they say that it's actually quite tasty and uh, even healthy. Yeah, well, they say we should have a lot of iron in our diet, too. But you know what? I'm not about to eat a railroad pie. Fermented yak butter tea is made by boiling a large brick of black tea, uh, preferably from a very specific region in Tibet with some uh, water to produce an earthy brew called chaku. Now, after you stir this stuff for a while, the tea acquires a stew-like consistency. Then, a mix of salt, yak butter, and milk are added to it. The entire process can take up to 12 hours or more. Today, uh, Tibetans speed up this process by using a blender. Uh, Due to its high calorie count, many Tibetans drink butter tea during the winter to stay warm. Uh, As far as the uh, uh, flavor goes, uh, fermented yak butter tea has a, quote, distinctive flavor. Yeah, tastes like a fucking yak. Well, now, if that doesn't shave your yak, then how about this? Panda dung tea. Oh, for crying out loud. (laughs) This, Mr. Keynes, is one of the most expensive teas on the planet. You have to pay around $35,000 per pound for this experience. Are we talking panda poot here? Uh, Yes, we are indeed. But, But rest assured, 
There's actually no panda excrement in this tea. Farmers uh, do use it, though, to fertilize the soil where the tea leaves are grown. As it turns out, uh, pandas can only absorb about 30% of the vitamins and minerals in their diets, which makes their excrement an excellent fertilizer for plants. Well, you can actually say this tea tastes like shit. (laughs) Uh, So there you go, friends. A little cornucopia of tea ephemera. Yeah, bottoms up. Content may be disturbing for some viewers. Well, another historic landmark is coming down to make way for another stadium. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, this is another Florida story. But no, no, no. This one is located in none other than Sin City. Altoona? Uh, Las Vegas, Mr. Keynes. The famous Tropicana Hotel and Casino has closed its doors and will be demolished to make way for a ballpark. Oh, the Rat Pack will not be pleased. True, true. When the uh, Tropicana opened on Las Vegas Boulevard in 1957, it was the most expensive resort that had ever been built in the city. They advertised it as the, quote, Tiffany of the Strip. Uh, For decades, the resort hosted uh, the city's longest-running show, of course, the Follies Bergère Cabaret, with its iconic feathered showgirls. There were, of course, the rumors, uh, just rumors, of course, of uh, mob connections. Among its most famous guests was James Bond. That's right. The film Diamonds Are Forever was uh, filmed in part at the resort. And uh, the resort, now one of only two on the Strip that still date back to the 1950s, is set to be demolished later this year to make way for a new Major League Baseball stadium that is expected to host the Oakland A's starting in 2028. In its heyday, of course, the Tropicana was considered incredibly luxurious, says Michael Green, an author and professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, who specializes in the history of the city. He says uh, the magicians Siegfried and Roy made their Las Vegas debut there, and the resort's Blue Room venue was the stage for many of jazz's greatest musicians during the 1960s. But you know, in the decades since, the Tropicana had fallen out of fashion. It uh, changed ownership repeatedly, finally selling in uh, 2022 for just $308 million as uh, its most profitable competitors like uh, the Wynn and the Bellagio regularly generate more than a billion dollars each year in revenue. Holy carp! Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael Green also made an observation that is uh, (laughs) a cold, hard fact these days. He says that uh, one of the things we've had to reconcile with ourselves still is that people do not come to the Strip looking for that past. They come here looking for all the bells and whistles that tourists look for these days. Well, you know, it's probably okay. Because a lot of the people that remember that past are probably long dead. (laughs) Or maybe they're zombies. And in that case, you really don't want them coming back and chewing your head off while looking for that Joey Bishop show. Now, wait a minute. I remember those shows. Feeling hungry? (laughs) You know, you do look a little gray. (laughs) Over the past few decades, the uh, Tropicana had changed hands repeatedly, and uh, an agreement was later announced to uh, demolish the resort to make way for the uh, future ballpark. And that demolition has been scheduled for October of this year. Are you peckish? Uh, Speaking of brain-eating zombies, we've got some news. Uh, From that area, down there, in that area. I'd say it's a first example of a segment... Within a segment, friends, because uh, although it's a, yes, sunshine hate themed story, it's also another excellent example of. Lying liars that lie. You know, 
It's fair to say that every state amplifies its positive virtues, right? And, you know, and tries to minimize or in some cases outright lie about the downsides. But uh, this one is quite remarkable. Now, we've been hearing, uh, even lately, about the attraction of Florida and its, its, its grand and glorious incentives. Like its mission to turn the clock back to 1950. Yes, and its lovely sandy beaches. And its book banning. It, did I mention the sandy beaches? And the bugs the size of Buicks. I, I did mention the beaches. Well, despite the Chamber of Commerce spin and the uh, 700,000 folks who moved there in 2022 and uh, that it was reported to be the fastest-growing state in 2023, all that glitters, friends. While hundreds of thousands of new residents have indeed flocked to the state on the promise of beautiful weather, no income tax, and lower costs, nearly 500,000 left in 2022, according to the most recent Census data contributing to their move was a perfect storm of soaring insurance costs, a hostile political environment, worsening traffic, and extreme weather, according to interviews with more than a dozen recent transplants and longtime residents who left the state in the last two years. Quoting here, It wasn't the utopia on any level that I thought it would be, said Jody Cummings, who moved to Florida from Connecticut in 2021. I thought Florida would be an easier lifestyle. I thought the pace would be a little bit quieter. I thought it would be warmer. I didn't expect it to be literally 100 degrees at night. It was incredibly difficult to make friends, and it was expensive. Very expensive. I had been so disenchanted with Florida so quickly, Cummings said. There was this feeling of confusion and guilt about wanting to leave or moving there, then realizing this is not anything like I thought it would be. Liars! Homeowners insurance rates in Florida rose 42% last year to an average of $6,000 annually, driven by hurricanes and climate change. And the car insurance in Florida is more than 50% higher than the national average, according to the Insurance Information Institute. In the past, it was seen as a, a very affordable housing market. Florida is now among the more expensive states to buy a home in, with prices up 60% since 2020 to an average of $388,500, according to Zillow. It's so much more affordable. Why, they're moving here in droves. Liars. And along with these uh, rising costs, many new residents say they feel generally unsafe in the state. Between the erratic traffic and a state law passed in 2023 that allowed people to carry concealed weapons without a license, this reverse migration out of Florida isn't just among newcomers, but also evidently, among longtime residents who said they just can no longer afford to live there and are uncomfortable with the state's increasingly conservative policies, which in recent years, (laughs) as we know, have included, oh, a crackdown on undocumented immigrants, a ban on transgender care for minors, state interventions in how race Slavery and sexuality are taught in schools and a six-week ban on abortions. For some Florida newcomers, though, politics is really the main draw to the state. Said John DeSottles, who has sold real estate in Florida for decades. And uh, while politics never used to be a topic for homebuyers, apparently, DeSottles said it is now a regular subject his clients bring up. Rather than asking about schools or amenities in a community, prospective buyers are asking him about political affiliations of a certain neighborhood. Wow. So along with checking for shady building practices, now you got to check to see if there are any rabid maganoids living in your hood. So it would seem, Mr. Keynes. So, as we said at the top here, uh, figures lie and... Liar's figure, and I I suspect a portion of those uh, exiting, sadly, 
our educators, which really is a shame because uh, the students suffer there. It's just another broken road sign on the abandoned turnpike that takes us to the off-ramp and inevitable question... What the fuck, Florida? (laughs) And with that, friends, we'll call it a show, but not before thanking our contributors to this edition of Fusebox, Kevin Cook and Gregory Wilson for splendid voiceoverment-isms. Thanks as well to the interdepartmental man of mystery, the deacon of the dials, Milt Keynes, for technical assistance and so forth and so on. Well, pleasure's always. And uh, folks, you, you know the drill. You can really help us out and show a little love for the show by joining us on Patreon. We're getting a little something for your efforts, too. Indeed you can. You'll get free swag, early access to shows, and original content created for our Patreon members. Yeah, just swing on over to patreon.com forward slash the fuse box show and sign up. It's cheap, too. For less than you spend a month on pickled frog lips, you can support this show for an entire year. Hell, maybe a couple of years. That shit is expensive. Yeah. Thanks as well to the good and grainy folks at Grindhouse Resurrection Magazine for their kind support, and uh, do check them out at 42ndStreetPete.net for all the details. Thanks most of all to you, friends, for pushing play on this one. We are most grateful for your attention, and uh, feel free to check out the YouTube version of this very show for an enhanced experience. Mm Mm-hmm. Link in the show description. I have been your Flash Frozen for a Crackly Crunch host, Mark Rose, saying... Until our next cartoon. Fuse box.